My name is Maya Rosecrantz, and today we're going to talk about the Golang Garbage Collector. Um, so most of this information from this talk uh, was just taken from uh, like reading through the source code. Um, I read a book called The Garbage Collection Handbook um, and other talks and presentations. I'm not by any means any sort of garbage collector expert, um, but I think this stuff is just really interesting. So let's get started. So the whole point of a men memory management system is to give us the illusion of infinite memory. So I write and manage um, like a Golang code base, and I just kind of want to write objects and then have them get cleaned up, and I don't really want to worry about it. Um, so I do the memory allocation part, um, and then something in the background, the garbage collector, will do the marking of live objects and then the cleanup of dead objects. And um, throughout this talk, I'll use live and reachable kind of interchangeably, like reachable code, uh, and dead and unreachable. Uh, and the contents of this talk will sort of mirror that. We'll talk about how garbage is made, um, how it's cleaned up, and then how to measure the performance of that before we talk about how to configure the garbage collector. Okay, uh, here is a nice and trivial example. Um, I have a struct that I'm returning. Um, each go routine is allocated a user stack, and we'll see that that stack will have a stack frame for main, a stack frame for new duck, and that will actually make our duck object. The new duck will return, and then the main will return. And we'll see that that duck object goes away. So stack allocation is uh, cheap uh, and very simple. Uh, and in this case, we didn't have to do any sort of heap allocation, and those objects just clean themselves up. Conversely, if I change this example very, very slightly, so now we're returning a pointer to the duck rather than just the duck value, um, we'll see that this actually goes to the heap now. Um, and this go inline bit is just so the compiler doesn't do some fancy inlining bits. Um, and when that gets cleaned up, I see the pointer goes away, but that duck object stays around, and now we have garbage. Uh, so our garbage collection can do something. And I can see this behavior if I run my program with this uh, GC flags option, it shows me the compiler's escape analysis. Um, so there's a lot of changes, even as recently as 111, I think 112 has more, uh, on compiler escape analysis. So it, it's the part that determines what part goes to the stack and what part goes to the heap. And as much as possible, Golang will optimize to put things on the stack. Um, in this case, my pointer has to go to the heap, so that's where it goes. All right, now we get into the triggering of the garbage collector. Um, so at the end of my last garbage collection run, uh, we're going to start at that point, uh, I have 50 megabytes of live objects. These are things that I still have reference to uh, in variables in my stacks. Um, and we're going to say that now that we have 50 megabytes, I'm going to, in effect, double my live, uh, my, more, sorry, my set that I'm going to kind of hold in memory before I trigger again. So in effect, 100 megabytes. And then maybe at that point, when we uh, finish with this, we'll say, maybe it'll shrink back down. Now our live set's back to 50, so then the next time we'll trigger again, we'll, we'll again be 100 megabytes. <laughs> so in this way, we kind of try to maintain um, our heap size uh, while accounting for any changes. So if you have a spike in traffic, maybe your live heap size will go to like 100 megabytes for a while, and then we'll trigger at 200. Maybe it'll shrink, and we'll come back to here. And this is, this is the default behavior. We also have to take into effect the um, actions of the scheduler. Uh, so this MacBook Pro is like an Intel i5 dual core. Uh, so we have our cores at the bottom. And each core, I think, on this machine can run four OS threads. Um, and then the scheduler is responsible for putting your Go routines on those threads. Uh, obviously, this computer can run more than eight Go routines. So the scheduler is responsible for swapping out Go routines as they need CPU time. Uh, so from the developer standpoint, it looks like more than eight things can run concurrently, even if, in actuality, about eight things are actually executing at one time. So when I run garbage collection, though, um, the garbage collector pacer will coordinate with the garbage collector scheduler, sorry, or sorry just this general scheduler, to figure out um, how many of these OS threads uh, should start switching towards garbage collection. So you can kind of see here that we're starting to sacrifice 
uh, program throughput in order to run our garbage collection. And then also sweeping has to actually take um, time as well. Um, and so the pacer here is responsible for stopping concurrent mode failure. So we don't want to generate more garbage than we can clean up. So potentially, you know, we could be running like seven uh, threads of um, garbage collection, only one of uh, actual program mutation. All right. So the actual algorithm is concurrent tricolor mark and sweep. Uh, it's also non-generational and non-moving. Um, I don't think we're going to have time to actually go into what this means, but if you want to talk about it, um, come chat with me afterwards and I'm happy to go through it. Okay, uh, so what it looks like in actuality. Um, so we have our program on the left, it's doing things to the stack and kind of writing things to the heap as well. Um, so we, stop, we, we start garbage collection with the stop the world time. So this is, we tell every single go routine to stop. Um, and that sounds a bit scary, uh, and we'll kind of go into that a bit more. And then we put in a write barrier, and so this is that we want our program to write things slightly different while we're in garbage collection than normally. Uh, this stop is also to tell any previous uh, sweeping cleanup runs to stop, uh, because now we're back into like the garbage collection run. Um, then we'll unstop the world and say, program, you can continue to run. We'll leave that white barrier in place. And so when we write new objects, we'll kind of mark them specially. And then we go into the mark phase and we'll kind of mark our objects that are live. Okay, at this point we've finished with our marking. So we run another stop the world. And this is to make sure that all of our user threads, um, user stacks are done marking and also uh, to kind of run any last minute cleanup we have to do. And this is kind of the longer of the two stop the world phases. Uh, at that point, we'll remove uh, the right barrier and in the background now, uh, the scheduler will schedule um, sweeping. And so those objects that are dead uh, will go away. Uh, and actually, I had a conversation just before um, this morning um, about how there's changes in 112 to make this sweeping much more aggressive. So it will happen uh, faster now rather than like potentially minutes after um, you finished your, your garbage collection run. Uh, and these are like the big milestone changes of the garbage collector. So 1.0 was just basic mark and sweep and that had uh, sometimes seconds of stop the world time. And each of these changes have really been focused on reducing the stop the world time because your program's not running. Um, so 1.9 has kind of the latest big one. And then since then, we've seen a lot of changes uh, more towards the compiler and escape analysis. Um, so this is sort of like a rephrasing of that scheduler slide. Um, in order to have the lowest possible latency stop the world time, uh, we end up making some trade-offs on, on the, the garbage collector throughput and the program throughput, right? When we're running garbage collector, we can run less program code at the same time. Um, and this is so that we, we're not just stopping the world and saying, we're going to do no program throughput and we're just going to run the garbage collector. Now we get to the measurement. How do I know if the garbage collector is a problem? Um, so this is sort of an aside. Um, I don't know if you've seen the blog post like the Haskell garbage collector versus the Golang garbage collector. Um, I think the point I want to make is that maybe you should take them with a grain of salt um, because oftentimes they're purposely generating a lot of garbage just to kind of like exercise the garbage collector so it might not behave as your real program actually will. Um, there's also been some academic studies done that says there's an optimum data set for any algorithm so the Haskell um, garbage collection algorithm is like one of the four different types and Golang has a different one. So there's an optimum data set for that. Um, that said, benchmarks can be super useful for um, stress testing um, and finding your code hot paths. Okay, uh, so now I have a code example. Let's see if this works. So here is a not practical example. Um, I, in the second talk, we had this nice gorilla um, performance improvement that we could make. This is uh, a little more contrived, but um, will hopefully prove my point. Uh, so we have this bird interface, and we have our main, which is going to make 100,000 instances of this 
kind of silly duck struct. And this duck struct contains this saying, and this saying uh, is a 5,000 line string. All right. Uh, so in the other talk, they used uh, the, the web interface of pprof. We're going to use the bench interface of it. Um, in effect, it does the same thing. Uh, we're just entering it in a slightly different way. Um, so I can see that my code takes a third of a second to run. Um, and uh, if I look at the memory, which I actually have to run it to generate memory profile, Uh, I can see I'm generating 91 megabytes of data. Um, and this is data that goes to the heap. Um, and maybe that's fine, you know, like I can just pay EC2 more money and they'll handle it fine. Um, but maybe I get the requirement that, hey, your code is actually too slow, right? Because uh, I can sort of think of, you know, maybe allocation is speed. And I don't really know how much that is, but now we can find out. So open the other window. Um, I want to see here that, uh, find out where my allocation is happening. So, make this a little bigger. I can see that line 10 escapes to the heap, A escapes to the heap. Uh, and line 10 would show that it's this bird talker bit. So what is concerning about this? Well, all this is doing is really saying, hey, I take, an in, uh, take the interface bird and return its value. Um, well, it turns out interfaces are pointers to pointers. And I think actually the first talk talked about this a little bit. Um, and the problem with pointers to pointers is that that double interaction cannot, uh, the escape analysis can't deal with that. So that goes to the heap. So, here, I'm going to make a one word change, change that to a duck. And if I rerun my benchmark, all of a sudden I'm taking uh, a hundredth of a second. So you can see that that's kind of a fairly large change just with allocation of the stack versus the heap. All right. Well, I think I want to make one more point here. There's definitely a place and time for interfaces. And in this case, it was just an unacceptable time trade-off. Uh, and it's definitely something that you have to figure out for yourself what to do. Because, you know, a lot, like, this could have been a pointer, for example. And I might have had to do something, like, fairly unidiomatic in order to, like, keep, uh, have the value update rather than, um, like, nice pointer return methods that do easier updates. Um, but I do want to highlight these tools um, because I think that, you know, if you come away with one thing is, is that I hope that you see that these tools are pretty easy to use and you can plug them in against your code fairly easily to kind of see your code hot paths. Um, there's also sync pool, uh, which caches objects that could be dead or alive. And even if they're dead, the garbage collector won't mark them for cleanup immediately. So if you're creating a lot of soon-to-be-dead objects and then recreating them soon afterward, this can be a way to kind of keep them around for a bit longer uh, and not take that allocation cost over and over and over again. Um, the other bit that this showed us is, yes, stack allocation was cheaper than um, like the original, but also um, there was only about three garbage collection cycles in there. So that's, I don't know if you can see, there's a tiny bit of red way on the left there's about 0.3 milliseconds of actual stop the world time. So the stop the world time didn't affect this too much. Um, obviously, some of this time is like the garbage collection scheduling, kind of throttling some of the program scheduling. Um, and also to put 100 microseconds into scale, um, humans can only process visual stimuli at about 13 milliseconds. And if you're kind of dealing with any sort of network traffic from here to somewhere else in the world, well, you're probably not going to be at the speed of light, so you have um, latency there as well. Okay, so now we can talk about modifying the garbage collector. So, um, I think 
the interesting bit here is that unlike Java, there's almost no configurability to it. Um, the decision was made that as developers, we shouldn't have to modify the garbage collection um, every time we switch hardware. So they gave us uh, all of one knob. And that is called GC percent. Uh, you can set it with go GC equals 100. And that, I think of these numbers as percentages uh, when you run your program. You can also set it at runtime with set GC percent. And in effect, this is uh, changing when your garbage collection algorithm is triggered. So in the earlier slide, I showed it's in effect when it's doubled. So that's the default behavior. Um, so like 100% of 50 plus 50 would be 100. If I switch it to a larger number, um, 300% times 50 is 150 plus 50, that would be 200. Um, in this use case, um, I am deciding that I don't want to run garbage collection as often, right? So I'm taking a hit on my heap, so I'm using more memory, uh, and more of that can just sit around dead, but I'm running the CPU processes for garbage collection less. That said, so I'm, I'm running the mark phase less. The sweep phase will have more to do because I'm probably going to have more garbage to clean up. So it's not, it's not a perfect analogy of, of um, memory for CPU. But the, you're, you kind of see some of that direction here. There's also the opposite. I can shrink it um, and, yeah, run it more often. There's um, also a knob that might come up. I first heard mention of this in January last year. Uh, it's called max heap size. And the idea behind this is that you take a bit of a hit um, when you check, when, when, when um, your allocator has to check whether you're going to run out of memory or not. Um, and if you run out of memory, it throws a panic and you, you lose the illusion of infinite memory. You know, you have a panic in your system. Uh, so the idea was you could set your max heap size uh, to your RAM and uh, hypothetically it would stop this problem. Now the problem is your memory has to include your heap, your stack, and your globals, so you can't just set it to your RAM size, you have to kind of like account for that fuzziness. Um, and you can sort of mimic same, similar behavior with GC%. Um, you can query your program for its runtime mem stats to see how much memory you're using, and then just run garbage collection more often as you approach the limits of your code, I mean of, of your uh, memory. Uh, the thing is here that you're also sort of tuning your memory for your hardware, so there's kind of like pros and cons there. And actually, that's it. 